the what is it? Let's see what is embolism and what is it? What is it by embolism? Detection of uh, sorry, detached intramuscular mass, whether it is solid, liquid, or gas carried by a blood from from a point of its origin to the distant distant site, the tissue uh, which leads to this tissue function, dysfunction, and infarction. And embolism is the process by which an embolus moves in the blood in the blood vessel. What fat embolism? The presence of microscopic fat globule uh, is called uh, is uh, from the bone marrow in fracture of long bones, soft tissue uh, from in case of trauma or even in case of burns also. When there is a risk factor for the fat embolism like polytrauma, aerotraphic accident, with a patient with long bone fracture, pelvic bone fracture, intramedullary nailing, joint reconstruction surgery, acute pancreatitis, liposuction surgery, total patients on TPN, and uh, diabetes mellitus with uh, more triglyceride level more than 5,000, uh, 500. What happens? Uh, you, what is the pathophysiology? In similar skeletal injury, there is rupture of vascular sinusoids in the bone marrow and small vessels, which leads to, uh, which causes marrow adipose tissue herniation into the vascular space, which travels to lung, which may, and this symptom uh, like. Uh, it is not a key always fat embolism is symptomatic. It may, there may be symptom, but many times it happens that fat embolism is asymptomatic. Incidence of fat embolism is 90%, but it is asymptomatic. Many times it is asymptomatic. Right? But uh, that of fat embolism syndrome is, it is 0.3%. Pathogenesis. In, in this uh, fat embolism, we get, uh, there, is, uh, the, there is mechanical and biochemical uh, uh, way in which the patient get, the patient with the symptoms or the injury occurs. Like in mechanical, the fat micro microemboli and uh, RBC and platelet, fat, uh, fat microemboli, RBC and platelet aggregation, which occludes the pulmonary and cerebral vascular vasculature and causes pulmonary and serious manifestation. In case of and the biochemical way is the release of free the free release of free fatty acid from the fat globule, which causes uh, which is toxic to endothelium, which leads to the active uh, like uh, coagulation activate the activation of platelet and granulocyte uh, causes granulocyte recruitment. And the features on the depending upon the pathology, we get the feature right? as we see. The patients uh, like microthrombi, if uh, occlude the pulmonary vasculature, we get sudden uh, patient uh, we are having uh, uh, sudden onset tachypnea, dyspnea, tachycardia, irritability, and restlessness. If it if it occlude the cerebral vasculature, causes CNS features like delirium, coma, agitation. If that uh, platelet aggregation to the to the flat globule act, uh, leads to uh, and, act, leads to splenic sequestration, causes thrombocytopenia. We get to do this thrombocytopenia, you get diffuse PTGA and uh, RBC aggregation and hemolysis causes anemia. The, the, in this, the history of like uh, the history and clinical context it was, it is important for before diagnosis. The patient is like young individual having the history of a road traffic accident within one to three days after this injury, the symptoms get onset. Like we have seen in amniotic fluid, fluid embolism, patient. You get immediate symptoms during or immediate postpartum. In this, the duration is one to three, around one to three days. Uh, in this patient, even the even the post-operative period, patients are kneeling and all. In the history of road traffic accident with fracture of femur get operated for the same post-operative patient was stable, but within 12 to 72 hours, patient develops sudden onset tachypnea, dyspnea, cognitive defects, coma, GCS drop, PTHS. Or axilla chest. In this, the, the, for once we suspected, we get the clinical context. Then we have we have one uh, Gerd Wilson criteria, modified Gerd Wilson criteria, which help us to like uh, the, the help us for the diagnosis of fat embolism, which which consists of major and minor. The major one is we have already seen in the pathophysiology that respiratory distress, CNS features and PTCA or axilla or sub, subconjunctival 
and the minor one is this uh, features of it like tachycardia, fever, jaundice, oliguria, uh, emboli in the retina on the fundoscopy, fat microgroupils in urine, sputum, sudden drop in hemoglobin and anemia, and uh, uh, sudden uh, sudden uh, plat uh, platelets uh, platelet drop and increase in ESR. About workup. With chest X-ray, mostly normal or we get, we get diffuse infiltrate. CT scan, if we do, we get uh, groundless opacity. CT brain, many times it's normal, but diffuse white matter PT, uh, PTJ of, uh, of trauma because the patient is post, uh, like we may see. And uh, transesophageal echo, then Doppler study to rule out DVT, then bulk for, for stain, st we have to do bulk for staining or for fat. CBC and routine investigation like CBC, RFT, LFT, in urine, like urine, we get the fat globules, sputum study. In this, uh, if you suspect the fat embolism, uh, fat embolism uh, then, like, even though the, the fat is like, uh, if your routine stain causes the fat to dis uh, dissolve, so we have to use a special stains or even if, if you have to do with the biopsy now we have to do a frozen sections about management like like this we have to treat it symptomatic we have to go very aggressively a routine airway breathing circulation IV fluid to maintain hydration like steroids for the cerebral edema heparin like we have to use heparin we use heparin because he is a he have Heparin is having some anti lipemic effect, stress ulcer prophylaxis, and DVT prophylaxis. Sir? Yeah. So, so, uh, good. So, another thing is in your also, sorry, completely. So, just add to that, okay. So, fat embolism. So, what is the incidence of fat embolism? You just heard the whole topic. Amrita? Huh? Such a 0 0.3 percent. Uh, Elizabeth? You just heard it. So, what is the incidence? So, next slide. Yeah? Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. Uh, here. Next slide. Huh? So the incidence is 90%, more than 90%. So that you must understand. First thing, every patient that undergoes a surgery, every patient that has got a trauma, long bone specifically, if you do a blood, if you take the blood from the nearby area of that particular trauma, you will get fat globules. You're understanding? Huh? So if I have a patient that is undergoing a long bone surgery and I did a kneeling, just besides that I take blood from that particular area and send it for investigations, I will get fat problems. So fat embolism is near about 100% that is the incidence. However, the syndrome is not 100%. Understanding? That is what you must understand that fat embolism has got a very high fat embolism has got a very high incidence, okay, very high incidence, almost to the tune of more 100%, okay, in long bone surgeries and things like that. However, the syndrome is far rarer, which comes to somewhere around, say, 10%, high to 10%, 1 to 10%, various, various uh, kind of studies, okay, the syndrome is different. So, Ali, if I, if I call you here and put up three points, that you will say, okay, this is fat model. Put three points. Okay. Put three points. Because, because uh, you will be dealing with so many of these cases that you must understand that uh, what it is. So there has to be three, like I would say, cardinal features you said for aortic fibrosis, hypoxia, hypotension, and DIC. Do you think that there are three points that will come in your mind when you look at pattern models? Right now. Right now, 
right? Three points for you, please. Okay, three points, and uh, next to go is uh, uh, Ashok. Come, stand away. Huh? I put tension. You write down, write down, write down, write down. This your problem. Ashok. So you are taking write down. So we're taking three opinions, okay? So what uh, Ali has mentioned is uh, the three things that she feels which will tell her that this is fat and balsam is presence of hypoxia, presence of hypotension and presence of, of fracture, of a, of a fracture that's what she says. So that will tell her that there is fat and balsam. So there are three things, okay, that she says, okay? That tells her there's fat and balsam. So if there is hypoxia, if there is hypotension and there is wrong of fracture, I could call it pulmonary balsam. But you are saying this is probably the way you want to diagnose fat and balsam, isn't it? Okay. Long bone surgery, long bone surgery, and hypotension and fatigue. What about you? You can let's put the same thing if you want. If you feel they are the same. So what is missing here, Kimant? What is missing here? What is missing here is usually this classical triad. The triad that we normally talk about is the combination of hypoxia respiratory distress with neurological manifestations and then fatigue. So when you say there are three things that occur in the fat abolition syndrome, we will say hypoxia or respiratory distress, which I think all of us have said. Huh? You all will talk about fatigue, which I think uh, Ashok has talked about, fatigue. And the third thing that we talk about here is neurological symptoms. Huh? Exactly. So I was sleeping over. And he, when he was making the slide, he was probably sleeping. <laughs> there are only three features. No? Pulmonary, CNS, and petechial rash. Right? All of us were sleeping during this. So remember to. Uh, there are a few things. Critical care is not learning a lot of things. Critical care is learning very small things well. Hmm? If somebody asks you what is fat abolition syndrome, you have to say these three things. You have to say that there is respiratory insufficiency. It's very different. Huh? You don't have something like this anywhere else. Respiratory insufficiency, you have particular rash and you have neurological features. Okay, in fact, it is the neurology that is first seen in fat abolition syndrome. The first thing that normally see in, in fact 60 to 70 percent cases is agitation. Is agitation or drowsiness or, or some neurological abnormality or an altered mental status that occurs when you when you see fat abolition syndrome. Clear? Hmm? And importantly, this uh, let's come to before we get into the further features of this, let's understand why this occurs. So we did mention why it occurs. Why does it occur? One second. Uh, Abhijit, why does it occur? During, uh, during surgery, kneeling, arming, vigorously. So, so that was the mechanical theory. Yes. What is the mechanical theory? Again, say it again. Yes, uh, during surgery, long bone surgery, uh, during uh, reaming or. Uh, so only during reaming or kneeling the reaming. It's not like that. So just like in uh, what was the mechanical theory for amniotic fluid embolism? We said that the pressure inside the amniotic fluid becomes higher, the venous pressure reduces, and hence mechanically mm -hmm. amniotic fluid goes from here to here. Right? This is what we thought. It is transgressing from amniotic fluid placenta into the capillaries. Similarly, in any place, for example, classically long bones, 
if they are doing the surgery and the intramedullary area develops a hematoma also the pressure in the intramedullary area will be more than the pressure in the veins and arteries around it right huh? so if the, if the pressure is more the blood will go from here to here if you are leaving or doing intramedullary leaving or vigorously doing kneeling again pressure over here is more if pressure over here is more what is going to happen there is going to be translocation of these cells over here fat globules huh? which is possibly moving from here to here right now if it goes to the vein how are you getting all these things so what is happening from vein plus jarai vein se kaha jayega heart mein jayega heart se kaha jayega from the right heart where will it go no huh? pulmonary it is going to the pulmonary circulation so why uh, are you getting the rest of the manifestations you should just get pulmonary embolism feature that's tachypnea and s1 q3 t3 or tachycardia and right axis deviation along with chest pain these are the micro goods so so why that's why we don't know have a, that's why we have theories that's why we have theories one theory is the fact that there is a mechanical movement that happens which moves the fat globules from intra into vein from vein into right heart right heart to left heart and left heart to everywhere else this is what the one theory is the second theory is that when something like this is occurring when fat embolism is occurring okay there is fat globules that are released okay there are fat globules that are released the body so if this if this was the scene if this let's go back if this was the scene okay or oh, let's go but let's go to the fat globule theory first this is about mechanical theory the other theory was fat is getting released then it is getting hydrolyzed to free fatty acids okay now it is these free fatty acids that are causing large amount of free fatty acids that are causing the manifestation of ards bahut sara free fatty acid aa gaya ye bahut sara free fatty acid aane ki wajah se there is release of uh, all these inflammatory markers which are causing ards that explained this so this explained your hypoxia and respiratory distress even this fat free fat acid free fatty acid theory is explaining your hypoxia and respiratory distress right the third thinking is that okay when this is released when this uh, fat globules is released suddenly the blood uh, gets tissue thromboplastin activation this tissue thromboplastin activation causes an intense release of complement the increased complement causes ards and tissue thromboplastin causes dic so three theories we got which are the three theories that we talked about once more tema that is the theory so what is the mechanical first is the mechanical okay so you have one theory that is mechanical second theory biochemical which consists free release of free fatty acid free fatty acid theory okay and third one yes tissue thromboplastin dic ha huh? so you have three theories okay now the clinical manifestation i have just you know be very carefully the clinical manifestation is the fact of developing respiratory distress neurological weakness and ptk somewhere around uh, within 24 to 72 hours ha huh? of the entire problem ha huh? of the entire start of the start of the long bone fracture or long bone surgery or things like that right that is the so can you contradict contraindicate this Contra it contradicts this entire definition no if you look at it if it was mechanical the bigger the bigger the average is less than the medium the other bigger the that's why we say pre-term labor labor or at that time it is basically occurring we say at that time so mechanical theory becomes a theory again ha aisa dekhiyo to other way around theek hai free fatty acid release hua it takes some time for it to hydrolyze to free fatty acids so isliye 24 to 72 hours so this looks pretty okay This looks pretty okay. You understand because it's going to take time, no, for it to hydrolyze and things like that. And the third thing we will come to it is tissue thromboplastin theory. Okay, that's what's facing maybe causing this petechiae okay, that is over here. Okay, so these are these are these are all theories. These are not sure shot. That fat embolism may be this or that. So these are theories. You understanding? Huh? The theory is there is mechanical transduction, mechanical movement. There is free fatty acid that is going to be released, which is causing this all these entities, and there is tissue thromboplastin that is causing petechiae. Now let us come to what is sine qua non of this petechiae. What is this petechiae and how does it present? 
सबको इंजन टाइम हाँ, वैसे तो पेटी के रीड इट केयरफुली वो डर लेटर ये ऐसी लाइन चीज़ सो इट शुड बी वेरी क्लियर आये सब कंजेंट में वैसे नहीं आ रहा है इसमें क्या आ रहा है इसमें axilla chest axilla chest so you get petechiae in the anterior axillary fold you get petechiae in the neck region here and you get uh, 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 this over the axilla chest area axilla and neck this is where you get huh you don't get petechiae everywhere as a niche take if you will see the thing with the petechiae the huh this is very important for you to understand because that's where the theory comes in okay the theory is it's mechanical so all these fat globules are going to the aorta and the first place where it is going is near the aorta and since it's going near the aorta that is the disposition of the aorta so that is where the aorta is supplying the first organs to be supplied in that area and that's why you get petechiae in the chest anterior axillary fold in the neck and uh, in this particular area you understand so you are supposed to look at uh, petechiae here you can't look at petechiae down there petechiae is here clear you understood Uh, so the the distribution of petechiae is very clear. Okay, distribution of petechiae is very very clear. Neurology similar findings. The next thing where the aorta is going to translocate, brain. Okay, so you have microemboli that is going into the brain, which is thus causing to have small stroke-like symptoms, reduction in blood supply, causing the patient to get agitated. Clear? Ah, uh, there are small mechanical clots that are going on, mechanical fat embolisms. Fat uh, that are going and clogging small, 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 small parts of the circulation of the brain. That's why the most common manifestation that you have in these cases in the triad, which includes hypoxia, petechiae, and neurology, the first thing you will see is probably this. Mm -hmm. So you will normally get agitation, then petechiae, and then the respiratory distress. That is how it is going to be. You understand? So you have a patient that has been operated in the day daytime. And it is a regular femur fracture that has been operated. This patient is shifted to the ward. Night time you may get a call of agitation. Patient is agitated. This is how the call will come. The call will come when the patient is agitated. When the patient is agitated, you say vital signs stable as a. Are vital signs only? This is probably fat embolism because the context is patient has been operated for a long bone fracture. Patient has developed agitation. And now, if you examine them properly, if you don't remove his clothes and you just see his blood pressure and his pulse rate, you are missing out very important thing, which is petechiae. So under that, huh? That's why the examination becomes important. Classically, what happens is next day morning they are sponging. These are just people, lala, not there. You have not done the examination, and they classically next day morning you get that. This is what is classically seen. You understand? So as a doctor, you should start thinking of the context in which this is occurring. Okay, the context is this. So if he is agitated, I have ruled out everything else. I have ruled out sodium abnormality. I have ruled out hypox. I have, I have kind of ruled out other things, which 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 metabolic encephalopathy and things like that, and as calcium and all these things I have ruled out. Then the next diagnosis that is coming in this context is fat embolism. Clear? Clear this. Now I said that the hypoxia and the hypotension is not like amniotic fluid embolism. The hypoxia is not like amniotic fluid embolism. So hypotension now you understand is not there. You understand now? There is no hypotension that is coming over here. Okay, and uh, that's why the history context is very important. Though they mentioned the cardinal symptoms remain as petechiae, neurological, uh, and presence of hypoxia. Now, hypoxia is last I mentioned all the time. Why is that so? Because that develops in some time. It is not something that develops. That happens immediately. Because now you think of the theory as free fatty acid theory. If the free fatty acid develops, okay, free fatty acid is uh, and, uh, you know getting hydrolyzed and forming free free fatty acids. Free fatty acids is causing the release of complement. Free fatty acids is causing ARDS. This is going to take time, no? Yes, it will not be any more. You know, you saw all this happening, complement releasing, and then causing ARDS and inflammation and ARDS. Huh? It is going to be. Uh, it is. It is. It is something that is uh, going to take time. So, what is the X-ray picture you will see? Yeah. ARDS. It's fluffy shadows. So that's called as. It's called as snowstorm appearance. Mm -hmm. In on X-ray, in fat embolism, this particular entity is called as snowstorm appearance. It's called as snowstorm appearance. Patients are coming to X-ray normal. Today's X-ray is pure white. Yesterday's X-ray was normal. Today's X-ray is all white, 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 white. Snowstorm appearance. So in fat fat embolism occurs. What you are seeing over there in the X-ray, the reason of the hypoxia is ARDS, which is classically called as the snowstorm appearance. Snowstorm 
appearance. Class three called as snowstorm appearance. Clear? Clear? So now we understand how to diagnose, how to clinically diagnose this patient. Huh? Any doubts on the clinical diagnosis yet? No, it's not hypotension. No, it's not hypotension. No, it's not hypotension. DIC is not equal to hypotension. You understand? They may develop hypotension. That's what we are saying here. This theory is not completely right. No. That's why we have three theories. Why is there hypotension? Many people don't have hypotension. That's why this theory is not right. You understand? That's why there are three theories. You understand? That's why there are three theories. That actually they are referring to. Why? This is the question that I have. Why do you have hypotension? Why do you have hypotension? Because that is not the right theory. They might be. That's why they are theories. They are not the right thing. You understand? That's why they are theories. That's why we have put these theories in place. So many things can many things can be said about each of these things basically. Okay. You understand what I am saying? That's why there are these are the theories. But what you see as manifestations are renal, are respiratory. And there is petechial rash. That's why he had mentioned it is clearly uh, 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 not, sorry, pulmonary, mm -hmm. CNS, uh, cerebral, and diffuse pet uh, petechial rash. Clear? So, uh, the thing is, these globules go into the heart, and the same microglobular go into the brain. So, these microglobular can also go into the lungs. It can. And it can present the pulmonary embolism in the stomach. That's the theory. Mm -hmm. So, what you're saying is all theory. That's what the theory is. But it, since it doesn't do that way, that's why the theory is not right all the time. Are you understanding? It's just a theory. It can do this, it can do that, it can, we don't know. The answer is we don't know. You are understanding? That's why we put theories, no? Since we don't know how it really is occurring, like what he said, I can do this, I can do this, yes. That's what the mechanical theory says. But this is theory. You understand? This is theoretical that this is can occur. This can also occur, this can also occur, this may not occur, only these may occur, this may not occur, these two may occur, this is occurring, these two may occur, we don't know. We don't know only. You understand? So anything can occur. But at the end of the day, three things will be seen for the syndrome to be diagnosed. You will have petechial rash, you will have cerebral manifestations, and you will have hypoxia. Clear? That's what the GERDs and the Lindic criteria are. Actually, there are three criteria, four criteria. There is GERDs, there is Schoenfield, there is Lindic. There are many criteria that actually goes ahead. If you see, the characteristics of those are the same only. Okay, the characteristics will involve these things. You don't have to remember too much. It's this only. Your criteria will have. You understand? Huh? So, now that you've understood the clinical feature of fat embolism, what will be the laboratory feature? Okay, so let's go one by one. CBC? Thrombocytopenia. So, before that, anemia. Okay, so before before thrombocytopenia, you will get anemia. So you will get sudden anemia. You don't know from where you get this anemia. You get this sudden anemia. Okay, so there may be anemia. Hemoglobin is ten to the seven, uh, and you will have thrombocytopenia along with it. So yes, thrombocytopenia, anemia. Then, then anything else? What else? Should we get it? Got this? Yeah, sir. John Jones, you have shown the idea here. Yes, Jones. Only you, Jones. Yes, indirect hemolysis. You get Jones, indirect hemolysis. Hemolysis is occurring. So Jones, huh? Okay, and the rest of the manifestations you may you may do this 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 what you are seeing over here, fat microglobules in the eye and all these things. This is called as punctures retinopathy, isn't it? Punctures retinopathy. There are a lot of things under there. So that's why you get an eye checkup when you have fat fat embolism syndrome. Okay, so classically, this is seen in patients with long bone fractures, pelvis fractures, sternotomies. Sternotomies, okay, remember this. Sternotomies, fat, uh, pelvic fractures, long bone fractures. That is where you probably will see classically these cases. Okay, uh, with all these things. And it can also occur in non traumatic and non factor, non rotary accidents. For example, in pancreatitis. You can get it in pancreatitis. You know, you can get it in simple pancreatitis. You can get uh, fat embolism syndrome. You should be able to diagnose that pancreatitis. You can get it in um, in just EPN. You're giving total parental nutrition. You can get it. You are giving fat there. Fat global ki baat kare ham fat sirf body ke andar dal rahe. You understand? So they can get fat embolism syndrome, which will then look at the FFA theory. You understand? Just a TPN. So there could be non-traumatic causes for actually having fat embolism syndrome. Also, it's not always trauma, trauma, trauma. Okay, there can be non-traumatic also, also fat embolism, right? 
How do you treat it? How do you treat these things? So if you go to these things, what are the treatment that you mentioned here? Supportive, sir. Huh? Mainly supportive. Mainly supportive, but are there any theories? Any Heparin, huh? Steroid, CNS feature, steroid can be tried. Uh -huh. Like heparin can be tried. As so, steroid. So, so, we are looking at a theory that says FF acidity, complement, DIC. That's why we are looking at steroids. So, one of the things that you can probably try is steroids. Okay, with respect to ARDS, with respect to what is happening, steroid is one thing you probably want to try. Right? Huh? Then? Heparin. Heparin is something else that you may want to try. DIC, AAO, thrombosis is there everywhere, so heparin comes into play. But largely the treatment remains supportive. Clear? Yeah, largely the treatment remains supportive. But diagnosis becomes key in this case. If you don't diagnose, you cannot explain. Right? Any questions? Any questions here? Any questions? Sorry, sorry, what's the question? How to prevent. How to? Prevent. Ah, so how to prevent is being, first of all, uh, when they are when they're actually operating in the theatre, to not have aggressive intramedullary yes. pressures. If there is hematoma, drain it quickly. That's why you know, they keep saying drain, 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 drain. Uh, put the suction catheter, drain, drain, drain. Oh, even the anesthetist, they keep they saying drain, drain, drain. The anesthetist, the surgeon, they keep putting suction catheter, suction catheter. Drain, 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 drain. Don't do much kneeling. Skill technique, that is very important. Vent out. Uh, whatever you want to vent out, vent out slowly, don't vent out fast, things like that. So these are the things that will probably be. What was your question? Sir, that why are we giving heparin? Because they missed all this epithelium. So who said heparin first? Yeah. Hemant, why did you give heparin? Antilipidemic effect, just. Yeah. So the answer is, what he says is right. What is happening with heparin? You want to actually degrade these leaf, fat lobules. When you give uh, heparin, you, you release lipase. When you give heparin, you release lipase. So that's why when you have fat overload syndrome in TPN, you had heparin. When, when there is fat overload syndrome in TPN, you had heparin. Because heparin will actually cause a release of lipase. And lipase will cause these fat deposits to quickly uh, change most of it. You, you understand? Uh, to, to actually digest that quickly. So uh, heparin is used for that purpose. Heparin is used for that purpose. Whereas uh, uh, aspirin is used with respect to the DIC feature that you have, thrombosis and thrombo, uh, that the, the patient has. The DIC is basically in, increased coagulation as well as hydronolysis. So you might want to use aspirin maybe. Okay, what is aspirin maybe? But largely the treatment remains uh, steroids and supportive management uh, in these cases. It's very difficult to actually say give aspirin, give aspirin when you have DIC. It's very difficult to do that. But that is one of the proposed theories for, proposed uh, mecha, uh, mecha, uh, treatments for fat embolism syndrome. So now what you've understood, you've understood what fat embolism is about, you've understood what is fat embolism syndrome, you've understood the clinical manifestations and you must remember these three things only, okay? You've understood, uh, uh, you know, uh, what uh, what is the laboratory features of this particular disease and uh, finally you've understood about, uh, uh, about the treatment and management of fat embolism. So we've done hypnotic fluid embolism, we've done fat embolism, right? Uh, and we've done liver abscess, you know, let's do one more thing. Before we before we leave from here, let's do one more thing. Exam going in what's Let's let's do one let's do one more simple thing. Okay, let's do um, 